The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, Have you anything to hear to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead, on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses to these things. The Gospel of the Lord. It's wonderful to gather again this weekend. The joy of Easter continues here at St. Paul's Newman Center. More families feeling comfortable to return. Usually, Easter's a challenging season to keep this energy and excitement alive for all 50 days. But the power of more folks coming back each weekend extends that theme of Easter joy, to see resurrection really happening among us as our faith community comes back together as one family again. This weekend, I wish to spend a few moments reflecting on two powerful sacramental experiences of faith. The first one, is the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Anointing of the sick, which is often still associated with the process of dying, but the church has expanded it far beyond that. It's good to look at that anointing and to say, how is this connected with resurrection, with our belief in God's love and mercy? Some of you watching, you may remember a time when the church referred to this as extreme unction or last rites. The last extreme thing to happen before a person died. You might also remember a few people who intentionally decided to put this off as long as possible because the anointing includes the sacrament of forgiveness to wait until the very last minute to experience that forgiveness so that there wouldn't be any time left for us to do any other sinning. I know it sounds kind of funny when we hear it, but it was very much in the minds of people. This sacrament was seen as the last thing that had to happen to be sure we could get into heaven. It still is presented that way sometimes. Oftentimes I will get a call from someone. My dad's in the hospital dying. You need to come and he needs last rites. I do always do my best to try to be there. But I think again, that approach treats a sacrament more like fire insurance. We've got to be sure to get the priest there at the last minute. My friends, if God's love and mercy in the face of a person who's dying is dependent upon the presence of an ordained minister, I'm not sure what to make of that. It doesn't sound anything like the God of Scripture that I have come to know. Rather than seeing the sacrament of anointing as a, as a transaction, as something we have to do as, as a last effort to get into heaven, what if we saw it in the broader context? as an incredible opportunity for healing. Rather than a sacrament that tries to get God to do something, 
It's a sacrament that allows God to fill us with peace and love. Lately, I've spent a lot of time speaking with people about the importance of dying well, of dying with dignity. Those choices we make, especially when we're not confronted with a tragic or, or sudden death, but something that we know is going to happen. How do we engage that sacred and powerful time? This last Friday, I had two beautiful encounters, one with a member of our community who's been struggling with cancer for some time. And she and her doctors have finally came to the conclusion that it's time to stop treatment, to engage the beautiful ministry of hospice, to return to her home, to be surrounded by her family and friends, and to prepare to make that final journey into God's loving arms. It is so powerful when that can happen. It was powerful with my own mom. As we gathered in that room on Friday, it wasn't the first time she'd been anointed, nor will it probably be the last. But to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, to use the gift of oil and prayer and words, to trace the symbol of the cross on forehead and hands, and to once again allow her and her family to place themselves in God's loving care, to trust in God's eternal promise. You know, in almost every one of the resurrection appearances, the disciples don't recognize Jesus. I don't know why we delude ourselves into thinking we'd know for sure when he showed up. In fact, oftentimes, their experience of Jesus is accompanied by fear. And he says again and again, peace be with you. In those last days, peace be with you. I visited another man who'd been away from the churches, his words, for 16 years. It was so beautiful to be able to smile at him and to say, but here you are now, right here in God's loving care. We talked about his life, his struggles, experienced the gift of forgiveness, and you could just see the change in his demeanor as he began to think again, yes, this is a God I can trust. Well, this sacrament of anointing, it's not just for those end stages of life. It's for any time there's illness. Any time we want to call upon the power of God's Holy Spirit, preparing for surgery, struggling with something. Maybe there are some physical, emotional, or mental issues that we want to bring to the Lord. To believe that in using this sacrament, the power of the Holy Spirit works in our lives. I think it's less about the possibility of a miracle cure and more about what happens when you combine good theology, good biology, and good psychology. The way when a person experiences peace, their body's able to heal. They're open to respond the very best way to any treatment that might become possible. The divine indwelling of God, peace be with you. So maybe this week, you want to talk with your family members. How have you engaged this sacrament in the past? How might God be inviting you to use the sacrament in the future? And maybe, maybe most importantly, what do you want those final days in your life to look like? Don't wait until the last minute. I promise you, it's those frantic calls that are the hardest, of wanting to be there and knowing that with the diminished number of ordained ministers, that likely won't be able to happen. But to remember, that doesn't prevent God from acting. It doesn't change God's love and forgiveness one bit. But to take advantage of the opportunity to feel that before we're in a crisis situation. Second thing to look at today, this beautiful story from Luke's gospel. Again, I wish the lectionary had not cut off the first part. It's the story of the disciples heading to Emmaus. Now, probably that at least rings some recognition in your ear. Remember what had happened? Two people were leaving Jerusalem, downtrodden, depressed by the news that they had heard. As they're walking along the way, a stranger comes and joins them, begins to talk to them. Of course, the stranger is Jesus. Begins opening up the scriptures for them, pointing out the way the word of God has been fulfilled in the story that they were sharing about this one called Jesus. And then they arrive to their destination. It appears the stranger, Jesus, is going on further. So they invite him to stay with him. And then it happened. In the breaking of bread, they recognize him. I think that is so important. They recognize the Lord in the action, in the breaking of bread. 
It's so connected with our experience of Eucharist and the Eucharistic liturgy. This time of pandemic, it's done a number of things. It's revealed to us some very powerful elements of our faith that we need to be together. That yes, our personal private relationship with God exists and is important, but it can't fully be lived without the community to celebrate, that longing to be with one another. Pope Francis and others have also highlighted during this time the availability of God's mercy and God's forgiveness. That it's not just restricted to the sacrament of reconciliation, but can be found in many, many ways. One of the things difficult that this time has highlighted to us is how many of us as Catholics can oftentimes be more interested in getting communion than being a part of Eucharistic transformation. I think well-intended, our desire to acknowledge and recognize the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, the consecrated bread, has unfortunately diminished our understanding of what happens in the Eucharistic liturgy. The church tells us that the liturgy, the Eucharistic celebration, is the source and summit, not just the eating of the blessed sacrament of the body of Christ. This opens us up or requires us maybe to think a little bit differently. One of the other sadnesses for me is that we're not able to use large pieces of bread at the moment, even though the church is very clear that's the ideal, that Enough bread should be able to be broken that some of the assembly can receive from the same loaf. It's a powerful image to say we are fed from one broken body loaf of bread to become one body in Christ. For the foreseeable future, we're still going to need to use those prefabricated wafers. But at least I know here at the Newman Center, we long for the time when we can use substantial home-baked bread again. Truth be told, For some of our students, that bread can be a challenge. They arrive and they're used to a communion that is really in some ways anesthetic. Yes, Christ fully present, no doubt about it. But in the wafer that can be consumed so quickly and returned to our spot, when we eat that substantial unleavened bread, it takes time. We have to think about what we're doing. It can be uncomfortable, but it's in the breaking and sharing that Christ is present. Another reality that this highlights is the difference between a communion service or receiving communion and participating in the Eucharist. And it's the element of sacrifice. In the Eucharist, not only are bread and wine brought forward and placed on the altar, but you are brought forward as well. Our lives are placed on that altar as sacrifice. We again commit ourselves to following the Lord by being broken open for the world. One of the greatest theological developments in the Second Vatican Council was our understanding of Eucharistic theology. Moving from a time when it was about the priest and what the priest said and the Holy Spirit working through the priest, that's still present. But it's not just the priest. It's all of us together. All of us praying for God's Holy Spirit to change this bread and wine and then to change this community into God's real presence for the world. A song that we often sing here, Like the Bread, describes it so well. Like the bread, we are taken. Like the Christ, we are blessed. On this altar, we are broken, given as food that all might live. It's a reminder that Eucharistic communing, that dining with the Lord, it's not just about receiving communion but it's about being broken and being sent for the world. It's one of the reasons the church invites us to try to make sure that every person is fed from bread consecrated at that liturgy, not from bread brought from the tabernacle. It still absolutely is the presence of Christ. But this presence is a living sacrifice, a living sacrament that should represent even more fully the sacrifice of each of us gathered as we recommit again to being broken for the world. In the resurrection, there are two primary ways that the disciples recognize Jesus. When they see the wounds, when they touch the woundedness of our world, that's where Jesus is found. And when they see bread being broken, when they see lives being broken, 
when they see you being broken, in the time you choose to spend with one another with those in need, when they see you being broken open in prayer for the needs of our world, when they see the commitment of of your financial resources in the so many ways that your life is poured out in response to the gospel call. That's what resurrection, that's what Easter is about. How is God inviting you to be broken this week so that the world might recognize the risen Christ in you. In the burning of our hearts, we saw the Lord.